Good morning. Would everyone please join me in the responsive reading? The universal door manifests itself in the voice of the rolling tongue. Hearing and practicing, we become a child. Born from the heart Capable of speaking and listening. With only one drop of the water, uh, with only one drop of the water of compassion, Spring returns to the welcome. <clears throat> welcome to Fountain Street. My name is Drew Potter. I have been a proud member of FSC for seven plus years now. I serve as an usher. A member, of, a member of Liberal Voices Group run by Carrie Kidder. I can be found most often drinking coffee in the Commons area in the in-between hours, and I encourage you to join me along with the usual suspects. If it's your first time here, take a deep breath and enjoy the air of free thought, of free asking questions, doubt, research, Hell, even run away if you need to. It's safe to do that. I've done it several times. But you won't be guilted a single time for poor attendance, lack of money, the clothes that you wear, or the clothes that you own. This is a house of all prayer. We are here to welcome you as you are, where you are, no matter where that might be. This is not an easy task for anyone, even myself. We are in fact surrounded by houses of faith at almost every corner here nestled in this mysterious mix of open liberal practice. Uh, and as a, a quick metaphor, uh, I describe this church as my metaphysical Doctor Who TARDIS, <laughs> my DeLorean time machine, a four-leaf clover, and a Hobbit Shire in downtown Grand Rapids. The force is strong with Fountain Street. Real people, real problems, real love, and real support. That is what we aspire to be. Welcome home.
Do you all watch TED Talks? I don't. I'm just not that good. I mean, they're so polished and so poised, and they walk on things. They have the same microphone, you know, and they have a really great present. I, I'm mostly making it up. I mean, I have my text in front of me, and I'll read that, because if I don't read, I could go on like a really long time, and a TED Talk's got to be like 18 minutes. So you're never going to get a TED Talk from me, but you will get a Fred Talk from me which is not the same thing. If you like the packaged thing with the poise and the polish, not happening. But I will tell you some things you may want to know. Uh, as my colleague Jason uh, mentioned, it is the day of Pentecost in the Christian tradition, which has its origins in this passage from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. I'm reading just a portion of it. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together one, in one place, meaning the followers of Jesus, after he had ascended into heaven. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. Have you ever been near a tornado? I'm imagining it's kind of like that. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues like fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. You may have seen pictures, little flames on their heads. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. That's part of the story. Way back in Genesis is another story about languages. And God said, look, they are one people and they all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, referring to the Tower of Babel. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. And so God scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there God scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And this comment on language is found in the Quran from the 30th surah, very brief. And of his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the diversity of our languages and our, and, oh, excuse me, of your languages and of your colors. Indeed, in that are signs for those of knowledge. Hmm. Do you remember George Zimmerman? Yeah, you do. I heard that murmur of, I wish I didn't. Well, according to a news post this week, the man who fatally shot Trayvon Martin in 2012 and was acquitted made headlines again on Wednesday for an ad posted on a firearm auctioning website called Gunbroker. The post listed the weapon that he used to kill Trayvon Martin, and in the listing it said, quote, George Zimmerman is in the listing saying this, I am honored and humbled to announce the sale of an American firearm icon. The firearm for sale is the firearm that was used to defend my life and end the brutal attack from Trayvon Martin on 226, 2012. According to National Public Radio, the Post concluded, I am proud to announce that a portion of the proceeds will be used to fight Black Lives Matter against law enforcement officers. If you want to know why I say something every week about Black Lives Matter, this is it. Because there are people who are frightened and feel that death and violence is their only defense. I can't make their fear go away, but I can insist that if all lives matter, black lives must matter more than they do. 
Between the cold and wet days of Michigan's spring, of which there were very few, it was possible to start cleaning my yard. Now, I should say mine is no victory garden like my music director who makes magic appear from her plot over there. Mine is more of a agricultural no man's land where I and the rabbits and the forces of nature have an uneasy armed truce. <laughs> so I go out there and I dig up the soil trying to find what has been lying in wait for the last few months and lo and behold I discover why my asparagus patch was so meager last year. Its roots have become too entangled and snaggled and they have to be separated so they can nourish from the soil and not deprive each other. There were, in a very small area, almost 20 crowns with their wormy little roots, and I took the best and replanted them. Who knows if they will come back. A lot lies beneath the surface when you dig in the garden the rocks, the roots, the spent shells of the nuts that the squirrels leave behind. It's a good metaphor for life, isn't it? When you start digging under the surface of things, odd stuff will turn up. And that's especially true for religion, because underneath of all the doctrines and the dogmas and the rituals and the beauty and the majesty are lots of cultural debris. St. Peter's, that magnificent cathedral built, actually it's not a cathedral, it's a basilica to be technical, is built over top of what is supposed to be the grave of Peter, St. Peter, which is, supposed, which is in fact located in a former Roman cemetery for pagans. And when it was first built during the era of Constantine, the cemetery was leveled so that all the pagan graves were demolished so that, the, so that the Christian temple could go on top of it. Here in my life, much less grandeur. A few weeks ago, a mother and daughter came, to, came here asking if we could help them celebrate the daughter's quinceañera. You know what that is? Okay, in case you don't know, it's a coming out, like an old-fashioned debutante system, for 15-year-old young women, especially in Mexican, Ameri Mexican culture, but also in Mexican American culture. I did some research because I've heard of this but didn't know what was involved, and there are dresses, and there are parties, and there are formal thises and thats, but it also involves a religious ceremony, mostly and most often in a Catholic church, but this is not a Catholic family. And so they needed a place where they could conduct a, a service, and they wanted to know if I, Gringo of Gringos, <laughs> the most Anglo guy in the entire of Kent County, would do it. Of course I would. But I knew nothing about it. And so I did some research. And yes, the Catholic Church is involved, but it is not a Catholic custom. It's not even a European custom. It dates back to Aztec times. Aztecs, not your Christian people when it was understood that 15-year-olds were now capable of shouldering adult responsibilities. It's like a coming of age, not just a debutante party. It really is a, a life moment. And so now I know more than I did before. That was buried underneath the other stuff that gets attached, the, the gowns, the crowns, the Bibles and the rosaries. Underneath of this are Aztec boys and girls. Wow. Pentecost is like that. As my colleague, who just who delivered the next two paragraphs of my sermon, he didn't know it, pointed out the word Pentecost is not a Christian word. It is a Greek word that literally means 50. Well, what gives with the word 50? Well, as my colleague announced, the time from Passover, not Easter, is counted off in 49 days. Why 49? Seven times seven, seven weeks is 49, and the day after is the 50th day. And so in the Greek language used during the period that the Greeks dominated the Eastern Mediterranean, the holiday came to be known as 50, 
Pentecostos. That was the day of Shavuot, which is the Hebrew word for weeks, W-E-E-K-S. How many weeks? Seven weeks. You get it now, right? But what has all this to do with the speaking in tongue stuff? Ah, there is a connection. It isn't accidental. In fact, the, 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 that Luke or whoever wrote the book says it's the day of Pentecost is telling us something important is going on on that day, that the Pentecost of the Jews is part of the Christian experience. And as Jason told you, Pentecost is two holidays, the wheat harvest and the ceremony of the receiving of the law. There they were at the base of Mount Sinai. There was Moses up on the mountain, God scratching out commandments in stone and saying, here, take these down so they know what to do. It was the creation of the covenant between Israel and God. So that means the Pentecost holiday is not about speaking in tongues. No, it's about creating a new covenant. And instead of having tablets of the law that we would all read, every one of the new disciples would be an oracle of the law. No longer just students, but, a, but messengers. And I'm not done. Because even belief of that is that story about the Tower of Babel. The tale of how we came to speak many languages, because after all, if you read the Bible, there's Adam and Eve and all their children, which became all of us. Why did they change languages? Why would anyone change languages? It would just make things messy. And so we have this story in, a, in, in Genesis, like the one that explains why we are bad, and why snakes are scary, and why it's hard to make a living, and why women have pain in childbirth. All those stories, including the Tower of Babel, explain why we are the way we are, and it gives us a story that explains why we have many languages and became many nations. And underneath of that, is the rationale that God gives in, this, in, the, in Genesis of why this had to happen. Because if people get together, they can do things, and if they do things, they can do bad things as well as good things. God, at least in the story, is worried that humanity will get too full of itself because they're building a tower a tower to reach heaven so they can equal God. They are guilty of something called hubris. There's your Greek words. You had two today. You think you can live through two Greek words? Pentecost means 50. Hubris, we usually think of as meaning pride, but it has at its root the idea of trying to be equal to God. <coughs> We're a long way from Pentecostalism now, aren't we, with the speaking in tongues and the exuberant religion of the Pentecostal church. So what's the point? I have no idea. <laughs> Which is my point, actually. The layers of time, of culture, and religion that are beneath the surface of whatever ground we walk upon are like separate languages, laid down at different times, sometimes in conflict, sometimes without even knowing each other. If you ever walk, driven through a, a cut through the, a mountain as you drive, you can see the layers stacked up on top of each other. And nobody put them there like a mason. They just happened. And this is where the Koran is so wise. And of his signs is the creation of heavens and earth and the diversity of languages and colors for those of knowledge. What I'm thinking here is that it isn't supposed to be organized. It's supposed to be a mess. It's supposed to be a babble. It's supposed to be confusing. That that's the way it is. And trying to figure out what's first and what's at the top and what's at the bottom and whatever's there must be the most. All of that is wrong. You know, babies around the world make the same noises for the first year of their life. If you could go listen to a Chinese baby or a Kenyan baby or a Oaxacan baby or a Michigan baby when they're all six months old, they all make exactly the same noises. It's beautiful. But then as they begin to learn words, they learn 
to make the words that their parents and others make, right? And the sounds they make favor those words, right? So they stop making the sounds that aren't made by the people around them. This is important because when I asked an immigrant Yemeni child years ago the word for bird, he made a noise I could not imitate. It's better than that in his mouth. I had a Polish friend back in Brooklyn who was trying to tell me, tell me that the bridge between Brooklyn and Queens was not the Kosciuszko Bridge, it's the Kosciuszko Bridge. And so I said, Kosciuszko. She said, you're wrong. She said, say Kosciuszko. So I said, Kosciuszko. She said, no, that's not it. She says, Kosciuszko. I say, Kosciuszko. I can't hear a difference. She says, you're wrong. I could not hear what she was saying. I thought I was making the same sound. I wasn't. So what's the point here? What's good about this not understanding? It's the not understanding that's important. Being unable to hear what someone else says is humbling. You realize they make sense, but you can't make sense of it. And of course, when I travel overseas, one of the reasons I go is so I can be confounded. I look forward to the confoundment. Why? Because it reminds me of how little I know. Of all the virtues we lack in this country, humility is the one we most need to get more of. It's almost an American humility, especially in Texas. I was a Texan for a while, and my youngest son, who loves Michigan with a passion, is a Texas native. In my beloved New York Times, there was an article recently about my previous state that echoed, echoed what I knew from 25 years ago, that Texans are more proud to be from Texas than anything else a humorous bluegrass group that actually comes from Texas, one of my favorite groups, look them up, the Austin Lounge Lizards, have a parody, a, 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 a satire on this. They call it another stupid song about Texas. I won't sing it to you because I cannot play the steel guitar. But one of the verses reads, By God, we're so darn proud to be from Texas. Yahoo! Even of our pride, we're proud, and we're proud of that pride, too. Our pride about our home state is the proudest pride, indeed. We're proud to be Americans until we can secede. <laughs> we are proud people. Americans are proud of America. I'm proud to be an American, proud to be a Texan, proud to be from Michigan. And I'm beginning to think there's not, there's a problem here. I mean, self-confidence is fine. But pride goeth before fall, doesn't it? That's what it says. Theologians will tell you that the original sin was not sex. It was pride. Thinking that they knew as much as God. And look where that got those two people. I think our world is drunk on pride. At least our nation is on hubris. Far from being a sin Pride has become the virtue, and humility has become the sin. The success of Donald Trump is a testimony to our perverse admiration of pride. People love his self-confidence, and they infer from it that he must be strong and smart. By contrast, humility is perceived as weakness, and to be deliberate is to be insecure. Please note I'm not commenting on Mr. Trump himself, but on his appeal. Were words like his to come out of the mouth of our current president, our current governor, or your preacher, you would rightly be appalled. But in the mouth of Mr. Trump, they are not merely excused, they are lauded, celebrated as evidence of his courage, his strength, and his willingness to be true to his nature.
It's baffling. I find it baffling. Or maybe it isn't. I'm going to let you in on a couple of secrets. Pentecost did not happen. No disciples in an upper room, no wind, no flames, no voices. And Moses did not come down from the mountain holding a pair of tablets, or if you're of a cheeky mind, with three tablets dropping one along the way. <laughs> Some of you got that. The stories, though, continue to teach a powerful lesson. In both stories, we have people who were transformed by a greater truth than themselves. It is said in the Torah that when Moses came down from the mountain with the tablets, his face shone. It, it, it almost radiated because it had been in the presence of God for so long. He was a different person. In fact, people were frightened of this shining quality, and he had to hide his face in his cloak from that day forward. The disciples who had met in the room to pray were transformed from disciples receiving the gospel to apostles delivering the gospel. They were no longer followers but leaders, both Moses and the disciples in these stories that didn't happen, but nonetheless form our culture in the way we think. They became what some people in some cliche would call servant leaders. That is, they are in service to a greater good than themselves, led not by their desire for personal power or their sense that they deserve it at all, but that they are driven on, driven on by a truth that they have received and feel obliged to share. To be a true leader is to serve a truth greater than yourself that will not let you off the hook, that demands that you serve it and share it. When we think of true leaders, we don't think of Donald Trump. We think of Martin Luther King. We think of Nelson Mandela. We think of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. And the reason why is because they weren't saying, make me your leader because I am great. It's because we said, I want to follow them because they are great. And they are great not because they made themselves great, but because they were seized by a truth they didn't even want to receive and told to live it or perish. It is how prophets become prophets. Nobody volunteered to be a prophet. They were plucked. Nobody wants that job. And yet, they live the life we desire. Not of suffering, but of service to a truth so great it cannot be denied, which humbles us rather than exalts. So the question I'd be asking you, the question I ask myself every day, what truth do we serve? And when I listen, all I hear is the babble. This, that, this, that, me, no, yes, yes. You hear it too. Everybody does. The pundits, the experts, the moaning, the groaning, the promises. Everyone hears it. And that's why Mr. Trump is succeeding. Because all we hear is the rabble, the babble, the, the noise. They shout louder than the babble, the, the strong men do. They say, I can tell you what life is about. And we feel good because they're clearing it up for us, aren't they? They're going to make sense of it all because we hate the babble. It just is in our head. They want to make sense of it. We want it to make sense. But here's the thing that we don't want to hear. The truth, the real truth, is always confounding. Now, you've sat by the ocean, maybe, if you've been lucky. If you're equally lucky and sat by the lake, what did you love about it? 
the sound of the waves hitting the sand and retreating, a sound that you knew intimately but could not predict. Or maybe like, uh, oh, there's Charlie, there's George, you're out there, and Gary. We have three fire fishermen in one row here. One of the reasons they go fly fishing is you get to stand in the middle of a moving river. And the sound of the water is hypnotizing in itself. A gentle babble, babbling brook, babbling babies, babbling idiots. Why? Because somewhere, somewhere inside that noise we cannot understand. We sense there is something profound ultimate and true that has no words. It's in the cardinal that every dawn sings a song that I can predict but cannot quite. It's in the way the wind pushes the trees and makes a sound that I cannot quite fathom but is beautiful to the ear. It's in the sound that babies make in their cradles. It's in the crackle of the fire in wintertime. It's in the heaving of last breaths as we sit beside someone, ending life. Babel is the truth. Not in its words, but in its sound. And not in the sounds, but in the thing that gives it life. It tells us the truth is beyond words. It can only be sensed, heard, felt, touched, engaged, but it cannot be said. When we give up knowing the truth and instead just decide to live it, to be in the stream, to be beside the ocean, to hold the baby, to hold the hand of the dying, when we admit the truth is larger than I am or you are, when we see humility as a gift, not a curse, when the truth that we seek becomes the truth that we serve, not the power that we crave, that's when we are alive. So how do we get there? I don't know. But I do know this much. It starts with listening more than speaking, being willing to humble yourself to something greater, rather than aspiring to greatness, to welcoming humility as a blessing, not resisting it as a curse. Can we do this? How can we not? The good news is that I get to try over and over again every Sunday. The good news is, maybe it's the bad news, you get to do it with me. And so here we are, struggling toward humility, listening for the babble, and hoping to live. May these words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found true in thy sight. Thou who art my rock and my Redeemer.